held MW from 5 to 6.15 p.m. Mondays and uh, Wednesdays. I sent you an email and I updated the Moodle page with the uh, Zoom link. And uh, we will be holding the sessions live and we will be recording them as well. Uh, the office hours will be by appointment um, and uh, we can always figure out a flexible time that is suitable for you outside your classes. I am in uh, US time zone, so the office hours will be in the afternoons or the evenings. Okay, so um, let's see now what we will cover in the course, but let's look first at the motivation behind our course. So if we go back to the 1960s, the mainframes started to be built and developed around, around that time. And then in the 90s, you had the desktops, then 2000s, the PCs. And today we are talking about an internet of things of billions of devices. And uh, the world around us is all depending on the computing power. And so all of this uh, boom or expansion had happened very, very quickly. And we're talking about hundreds of billions of connected devices and each one of them containing millions of uh, transistors. All this has started from a little bit of sand. So we were able to fabricate and make things that communicate and connect to each other from real physical material that we have around us. So we're in the time of computing, but there are many challenges and requirements. We want this equipment to be cheap. We want these gadgets to operate with low power to have their battery survive. And we want them to fit in everywhere, not only for special purpose applications. So if you look at the different industries around you, if you have the heart to or the courage to maybe open the phone or open the PlayStation, you will find that it has this PCB with many small chips and this packaging and a hard drive and all of these components where really the, all the functionality lies. And it's not only in gaming or at work, but also all of these functionalities have come everywhere to the automotive industry. If you heard this past year, there was a shortage in cars in the US and the reason is that the Due to COVID, the companies were not able to supply the chips and therefore people have to wait for two, three months to get their cars ordered. We're, and we're not talking about the autonomous uh, driving cars. We're talking still about today's cars. So big companies like, uh, like Samsung, TSMC, all these companies in Asia are now building a new fabs in the US in order to be able to meet the demand because of the limitations that this industry is facing. In addition to Intel opening the new fabs for the government, we're seeing now a boom in the demand in the semiconductor industry. And all of this because of the novel functionalities that are being embedded and required in today's uh, industrial designs. Not only uh, the car industry requires uh, design and chips, but also uh, medicine. There is a boom in biomedical engineering design that relies on nanotechnology. And this goes all the way from the nanopills to that Google has been working on that flow inside the body to labs on chip that are being designed for example, to test for and diagnose diseases like COVID or other diseases like uh, blood glucose or other types of um, uh, diseases that are handy to the patient at home and that will speed up the um, maybe lengthy uh, processing time in the labs that we are facing now as backlogs in the 
hospital. So biotechnology is booming as well, and it is relying heavily on these nanotechnologies. Now, we're all familiar with the pandemic or the COVID, and the chip power also went in there to help. So there is uh, IBM contributed with its supercomputers in order to fight the coronavirus. And uh, really the task was to be able to find 77 um, compounds which can be or have the potential in order to impair the COVID-19 virus. And in this, the IBM Power9 uh, server processor was at the heart of these uh, uh, stations. And um, the design was built in order to handle data intensive uh, workloads like uh, artificial intelligence and high performance computing. And if we want to compare the compute power, basically, uh, we can say that um, it's really, if every person on the earth completed one mass calculation per second, um, um, if every person on the earth, it would take them around three or five days to give the same power as what the summit or the collection of machines could do in one second. So we can see how demanding uh, those computations were and why this uh, high performance computing is needed and required nowadays. In fact, it is enabling all this big data crunching that is happening around us. And um, there are also several applications that spin off from these technologies. So as the engineers scale their designs, try to make them finite as we go to the nanotechnologies, people have been exploiting those new and novel devices in order to uh, cater other solutions or serve, for example, in order to test for cancer, to capture um, material or find or detect material within the body uh, so that we can rely on this um, uh, interaction between these novel devices and the material in our body to detect diseases and detect uh, uh, problems that uh, human might be facing. So what do all these applications have in common? Basically, there is a computational power that is here in need. So we need the big data demands high, high computational power. Okay, and this has enabled many applications that were not feasible otherwise before. And people have thought of a neural networks, but halted on deep learning and revived it today due to the high capabilities of today's processors. This is from one aspect, we have the high performance computing from another aspect, the emerging technology that is coming up today has enabled the new unconventional solutions. So solutions which people have not thought of before like the nanotechnology. And the idea is that in order to be able to exploit and explore these designs further, we need to understand the basics. How do these designs operate? How from a little bit of sand, okay, we are able to make something that functions, okay? And although today's technology is tomorrow's past and whatever technology we're dealing with today, tomorrow will die, something else will, will replace it. But once we capture the concept, then we are able to explore any new technology. It's exactly like programming languages, where if you learn C, you can learn Python, you can learn Java. It's exactly the same. Once you know the logic behind the tools that you have at hand, you will be able to maneuver and innovate in all directions. So today's technology is tomorrow's past, but it is the road to our future. Okay, let's look at this picture here. So this big barrel that we have here is really a cross section of the human hair. This red donut here is the red blood cell. And this gray thing here is the transistor. 
And this is a transistor which is 90 nanometer and 90 nanometer technology. Today, companies are already fabricating chips in seven nanometer and there is talk of three nanometers. So it is even like 10 times smaller than this or even more. So with the device size being very small and having to pack millions to billions of devices on the chip, things cannot be too perfect. We cannot guarantee that we can fabricate the switch to be perfect, and we cannot have billion instances exactly the same. However, what matters is that collectively they will function. It's exactly like when you talk about a neural network where we are not really having everything perfect, but somehow collectively, we're ending up with 99% accuracy. And we have to do this, but with a budget. So this budget says there are some trade-offs. You cannot consume too much power. You need to meet a certain delay because you need to give the response very quickly. The area have to be small because area means money. The chip costs the company as much as the area of the chip is. That's why we try to pack as much functionality into it as we discuss later in the design metric lectures. And at the same time, we need our design to be reliable and to yield. And if I fabricate 100 chips, I want to guarantee that at least 90% of them are functioning. So to meet all of these requirements and budget of requirements, we need an army of engineers. And at the end, no engineer wants his transistor to be the one that messed up the billion transistor chip. So we need to have tools and the system put in place and architecture. So really designing a chip is exactly like designing or architecting a building and stuff like that. So you need several layers, several engineers to interact together and all the way from the high level system design down to the physical design. So everything in life, just like the internet, it has a, an application layer and then the, the towards all the way down towards the physical layer, the chip, goes through the same processes from the abstraction, the system, all the way down to the design and implementation of the physical layer. So as we all know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. However, um, um, uh, that's the beginning of the journey. However, any, um, one small step took the man to the moon. So hopefully this step will inspire us and we can reach all the way um, to the moon and design uh, really innovative and novel designs. So let us talk about the course description. So the course is an introduction to digital integrated uh, circuits. And we're not going to design a chip but we are going to know the basics that get into this. There is a lab that uh, is associated with the course where you learn the basics of physical um, design and simulation. The material that we will cover uh, in this course, it we will first talk about CMOS devices and we will tell you what are the basic elements, uh, how we manufacture them, for you to get an idea how this happens, how do we realize this transformation from sand to silicon to uh, a working chip that can think and brainstorm. And then we will talk about the basic elements, which are the CMOS inverters. And then we will start to talk about the concerns that happen, you know what, how do we design? What are the constraints that we need to meet? So the delay, the power, uh, the noise margins, and then we will talk about how we build and optimize a circuit design. And now I want to build a function. First, we build a logic gate. Then we want to build a function from these logic gates. How do we optimize the area or size it for optimal delay? And then towards the end, if we have some time, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, memories. How we, what are the different 
first uh, design implementations and yani do we implement things in CMOS we can implement them in different design styles which are popping back now for in-memory computing topics and then we will talk a little bit about the basics of memory design and how do I store those bits on the processor what is a cache what is an SRAM cell well basically it's just two inverters back to back but we're going to give you the basics so that whether you're working at the architecture level or at the system level, there is a lot going on nowadays on the hardware software interaction because they are designing hardware or software specific uh, hardware designs. And wherever you are later in the future in a company that's tailoring the software or the hardware, you'll be able to understand the details and interact with these different constraints or concerns so we're going to cover various design styles as well as issues that the designers uh, face okay especially as the technology scales and as the designs are becoming bigger the chip is containing more functionality and therefore we have to take into consideration the impact of routing and connection just like there is for example congestion in 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 cities just like there is there are roads we need to design for interconnects they have some parasitic effect that impact the delay and there are also many constraints for the chips that we will just not we will not study all of them but we'll just mention some of these concerns or considerations type grade so first we will start with the core block which is the CMOS inverter the basic which you studied in 310 and 311. We'll study its different implementations. And what's interesting is that some of these implementations are coming back uh, to life in the, in the designs targeting in memory computing. So it's good for you to learn and understand about them. Then we will move from one simple function to building more complex functions such as NAND, NOR, XOR, which also you have seen in 311. And we will look at optimizations for speed, area, and power. And of course, then we will see how these gates can be combined together to build a function. And we will look at different design styles to implement those functions. Hello. After this, once we have our function in place, we want to look at the effect of the parasitic and yani how the interconnect can affect my design. It is basic, simple uh, elements that are passive elements, but we will look how to rely on lookup tables to study their effect, how to construct them. So I see it more as logical mathematics as opposed to um, uh, abstract devices. Okay, And then we will look at basic memory structures, and then we conclude with looking at different design methodologies that are available out there okay so the goals are to be able to analyze and design a digital circuit to optimize it taking into consideration different quality metrics the size the speed the power dissipation and the reliability to understand and to understand what this means okay now um, we're going to talk a little bit about the assessment. So on, uh, on Moodle, I have posted the course syllabus that has all this information. The final exam will be 40%. It will be on campus and the same for the midterm, it will be 33% and it will be on campus. The project will be um, 15%, it will be mainly a um, survey or a literature review on topics that are of interest to you. So towards mid-semester, I'm going to post some uh, state-of-the-art topics that are happening nowadays. I will give you a lecture where I will explain about it. And you will pick a topic and will um, work on it. Uh, we'll talk about it soon, it will be in groups, and there might be some analysis part, it will not involve you uh, simulating, but I will put some questions where you will uh, try to logically give an answer 
for some um, design behavior or stuff like that. So it will be more like brainstorming on logical stuff that you have learned during the course. So I'll show you some waveforms and you will um, comment on that. There will be five homework assignments. You will be, um, your grade will count the best four out of these five and this will be 10% and participation will be 2%. I know we are not in class, so participation will be whether you're asking questions, whether you are active on Moodle, you're submitting things on time, and you're participating as much as you can, if you can, yani in the um, online uh, session. Yes, Bir? Uh, Professor, I just have a question concerning the participation and attendance, mm -hmm. given that the class is online. Yes. Is it fine if we just watch the recordings? Because like some of us, this is our last class. And instead of watching it in university, you can go back home and watch the recording, if you don't mind. Yes, yeah, yeah, no, I, when I say about, uh, yes, if you, I, when I say about participation, Burj, I mean, and sometimes, uh, for example, somebody has not uh, logged into um, Moodle for uh, 17 days. And uh, every okay. time they don't send me the homework and uh, they are 10 okay, days okay. late. And, okay, thank you, Burj. Hala, طبعًا, it is preferred that we all interact. Yani, okay. If I see you popping into class and asking a question, then this is a preferred mode because the material can get complex with time and we're giving a lot of material. So if you can from home log into the session, I would appreciate that or at least, for example, bring your questions to class and that will be helpful as well. Okay. Oh, okay, thanks, Professor. Thank you. Very Hala, let us uh, now uh, elaborate more. Um, tentatively, the midterm will be Saturday, March the 26th. Okay. And uh, because you are a big class, and uh, I want to make sure that we find a good room for you. And um, there will be a sheet that I provide to you. So before the midterm, uh, during the class, we're going to have some problem solving sessions where I would like them to be interactive because um, uh, this way, yani, it will be helpful for you to practice also and to be able to answer properly the midterm questions. And uh, during these problem solving sessions, um, it's good also to bring your questions if you have some questions about basic concepts, reviewing, for example, the DC solution of the inverter or other stuff or the homework questions. So I would like those sessions to be as much interactive as possible because it does not make sense that I'm making a problem solving session for the course during the course time. And then you are asking office hours about the same. Um, it's good for you to be interacting with me. I would like the office hours to be to fill your the specific gaps that you have rather than just um, maybe repeat what has been said and done any for your good benefit to use it for your good benefit Hello. typically i will give you uh, just like what i will show you before the uh, midterm a, a set of equations that we will rely on and uh, the exam besides this, I think that's mostly what you will need. Besides this, the exam will be com uh, comprehensive and uh, closed book. Hello, late homework, uh, I'm, it's very flexible. You have really are graded on four, you have five of them. They will arrive every couple of weeks. We will announce it ahead of time and I will talk about the homework in class to give you hints and help you. So what I want from you is please don't submit it late. Um, late homework, like in 3.11, would be penalized. And please work individually on your homework, because when I see a homework that is perfectly copied, okay, when the grader sees that, they are flagging it to me. What is meant from the homework is for you to practice for the midterm to do well. Okay, so um, nobody will get a low grade. In the end, it is 10%. If you get 7 over 10 or you get 8 over 10, this 1% is not going to show with the race. Okay, so make sure you use it as a practicing experience. And for the course project, it's going to be a group of three students. 
So try to build your groups in the beginning of the semester. Towards the mid of the semester, I will send a sheet to request you to fill the groups. And once the groups are locked, then I will post something for you to select the topics. Okay. I might consider, depending on how well you do in the midterm, I might consider a bonus optional presentation towards the end of the semester, but let's talk about that as, uh, as things happen. Hello. I would like to highlight, please try to benefit from this, and this is 25-27% of your grade, this is almost 30% of your grade, so try to show me that you're participating, that you're doing your best, and I'll try my best to help you. In the end, if this will technically securing most of this grade and doing well on this part, I want you all to excel, but doing well on this part will guarantee your success. Definitely, this is a good booster or a good push up for you to guarantee the success. So let us take them seriously and let us try to make sure that it shows our own effort. And I like to read um, through the project your effort. I would like to know that you have put your best effort and that will pay eventually in the grade. For the midterm and for the final exams, I care a lot to see that you have answered. Never leave a question blank. If you leave a question blank, this means that you will. I will not be able to give you partials. So please make every effort to put your logic. I want to read your logic through your paper and give you partials on that part of your understanding. Yani, for example, the reason why it is a closed book is I can give you partials. Okay, so you have the equations, you go through the logic. Let us say, for example, you are say writing KCL and you've written the equation of KCL correctly. You have the equation of the current, you pasted it, you solved for the delay, but you had a mistake, for example, in how you thought the delay should be computed. You get the partials for calculating the current properly, you get the partials for the KCL. So this really helps. And um, there will be some quick questions where you just plug in the answers, but there will be questions where I want to follow the methodology of thinking, and that's where it helps, where you fill your real logical understanding. And don't forget about the project, the homework, and the participation. These are a good portion of your grade. Okay. Time. Anybody has any questions about the grading? Okay. Time. Great. Hala, uh, let us now, with all of this, if Many of you know me, I'm a very lenient, very flexible, very considerate professor. But as we said, don't copy your homework. Um, don't have somebody uh, write your project. Let's, let's not play these little tricks. What matters for me is to see your understanding. In the end, again, a decent project, we're going to put how many references we want, a guideline for you. For example, we want at least six references, but whoever will put the 12 references and will write they will secure a high grade. We will put the number of pages expected. We will try to have the grading of the project guided. So, so long you have adhered and understood what's going there around you, so long you have showed to me, and I will try to follow up with you on the project to understand each group, what is their topic, what is their progress, because that will help me also in my grading, okay? Uh, this is what matters, Yani. The project, of course, unless you send a blank project, you will do get a decent grade. So let us try to put our honest effort, and I will try my best to help you. Okay? And of course, in the exams, cheating is not tolerated, and uh, do your best, and I will, I will do my best to help. Okay. How are we going to talk? So the course is mainly about the course textbooks, there are some references that I think are available on reserve in the library. 
but um, we will have uh, basically the lecture notes I think are sufficient. So unless you're interested in, a, in reading further about a specific topic, you don't need the, uh, the text to have or buy the textbooks. And, and these slides basically are refurbished from uh, slides that are offered in many universities abroad. So they are uh, 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 يعني, comprehensive. They include all the material that you will need. Hello. From, from a software CAD tool, I don't think that you will be involved in size simulations um, uh, this year, because we have a new lab instructor and she's handling the labs, so she will not be able to help us in that direction. But what I will do is I will have some sessions where I will show you some simulations, maybe with some results, and then I will use some of these results to post them on Moodle and then have you answer some interactive questions. And the main motivation behind those experiments is to have to give you a practical mindset about the difference between, for example, the voltage transfer characteristics of the inverter, the Vn versus V out, and the difference between the DC response and the transient simulation response. And I see many students um, confused about this. And I think those couple of simulations will really just show us how the inverter works in time, what is the DC point where it falls in the graph, what's the difference between VO and VN, and between the time or the transient response, which is very basic. Some people get it very quickly, but some people it's better to demonstrate it and then it will be clear to all of us uh, and then you can do better on the exams and questions, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll not be confused. Okay, so, so they will be limited, but it will be more like one demo session with a few questions relevant to the course material that we are uh, studying. Or maybe I will include in each session 15 minutes. I will see how I organize this. Okay, so hello, we're going to talk about uh, the introduction, but before I dig in, anybody has any question? Okay. So. Great. So, I'll intro, where are we now in the world in terms of digital integrated circuit design? Why is it uh, so successful? Why today is different, it is different from before and how this trend is changing to shape the future of computing? Okay, so let us here okay, take one minute to refresh on the basic circuits that we know. And uh, sorry, let me go back. We have taken our courses before. Uh, we talked about circuits in 3.11 and 3.10. And in 3.11 mainly, we focused on one aspect, which is the, the circuit as an amplifier. Okay, so the transistor, it's a device, it's a, an element that can turn on, turn off, or turn on in between, yani weekly, and it can serve two purposes. The first is an amplifier, and the second is as a switch, okay? And our focus in 412 is going to be focusing on it as a switch. So let us look here at this basic simple circuit, which we studied in 3.11, okay? We used to call this, and we will not study it here as in this form, but just for you to know, we used to call this circuit, okay? Which has an input V in and output V out, or input X and output Y, as a common source amplifier, but we also drew for it characteristic function, tidy V in or X, and this is V out or Y, and we were told that this circuit combined together is going to have this transfer response. 
اوكي يعني حدا اعطاني mathematical curve وقال لي if I have x for each x value I'm going to find a y value اوكي great بال 3.11 we used to give it a signal and this signal used to happen here اوكي so we used to say if I give you a signal x that is that I say this is one volt that is around 0.5 volt but it is a fluctuating around 0.5 then my output is going to be in this range and kill point on x and the response on y every point on x will have a response at y and if I follow these dots and find the respective outputs I will get an output that looks like this okay and this we used to call amplifier لأنه it fell into the region which we call the high gain region. In digital design, we don't want this high gain region. In digital design, we want to avoid this region. And we want to benefit from the characteristics of this inverter or of this circuit to provide it an input, sorry, to provide it an input, let me draw the characteristics again, to provide an input that is either low or high, okay? If my input, يعني my input is going to be either here or here, يعني x if I draw it as function of t, it is going to be low or high, low or high. So when x is low, حنحكي عن المثير next time, the output حيكون high. When x is high, the output حيكون low. So the output حيكون opposite لل x. But they are all fluctuating, for example, between 0 and 1. How do we call it switching? لأنه the transistor is either on, or off, and we'll talk about them in the coming lectures. And therefore, it will either allow my output to go to VDD or go to ground. No intermediate voltages. This is the difference between what we learned in 3.11 and what we will learn here in 4.12. And this is why a lot of the complexities of the amplifier properties will go away. We will only have to deal with finding some characteristics on this voltage transfer characteristic. طبعاً بنا نرجع نعمل refresher على current model على more novel devices and their current model. But this I call it pure math. And then we are going to use this to approximate the transistor behavior. Okay, by a passive element or by a current equation to calculate the delay of a circuit, design for it, optimize it towards the end of the semester, etc., etc. يعني لح نأخذ the basics of math to our benefit, learn them, understand the device characteristics, and go up all the way to the circuit level. Okay, and um, anybody has any questions here? Okay. طيب جريت هلا we're gonna now continue with what's happening maybe we'll take a flashback to the past okay so computing machines the first computer was mechanical okay so they relied on mechanics on gears in order to be able to perform pipeline addition so the architecture mentality was there long time ago and this was in the 1800s, okay? And it costed a lot of money and had many parts. And then in the 50s, people designed machines using the same architecture in order to be able, using the, the new technology, in order to be able to perform or compute seventh degree polynomials, okay? So this is the Babash difference machine and analytics engine, and it was purely mechanical, okay? So this shows that really computers are just a machine or a tool that can transform this mathematics into some machine that can compute it. Now, computer 
is really a definition for a human job. In the past, just like we have a teacher today, we used to have people who would sit down and do work for eight hours, okay? Just doing calculations and computations. And we had many of these personnel sitting down to repeat after each other these calculations because they were uh, wanted to make sure that the calculations are correct because the humans are prone to error, right? So we can do mistakes. And especially during the World War, they wanted to calculate the trajectories of these big bombs that they are sending and they wanted to calculate them and, and they had all of this workforce sitting down and doing these multiplies and adds. And in 1946, in the University of Pennsylvania, they developed around World War II this large 1500 square foot computer using vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes are really, really like the neon bulbs that you have at home. And a 1500 square feet is, uh, is big. It's like a big apartment, 150 square meters. And they had 18,000 vacuum tubes and, and the tube would send a signal from one end to another. It was like the basic switch, like a transistor. It required 140 kilowatts and it was still not very reliable and they would feed it with cards and it can do 5,000 additions per second, okay? So this was the first general purpose computer, if you want to call it, okay? At the same time, around the same time, two years later at Bell Labs, they were sitting one day in the afternoon right before the Christmas vacation. They were experimenting with, uh, with material device physics and they had uh, the MOS uh, capacitor. So you, the MOS capacitor is really metal and then oxide. Okay, and then uh, they had on the other side silicon. Okay, they were trying to see, well, can I use silicon for uh, specific, for some purpose capacitor? And then somehow, somehow they tapped in here and here, and they discovered that there is a current flowing. Okay, and so this was the beginnings of the transistor. We're going to talk about the structure of the transistor. They found that when they apply a voltage here, they have a current flowing down through the lower layer. And they discovered basically, this is the basics for the, the CMOS, the NMOS transistor. And really they, they started to come up with these different designs in the years thereafter. Then they started to come up with different logic families. And the first um, IC was designed by Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments. And then the first commercial integrated circuit, yani the transistors were printed together on one chip instead of the discrete components that you see in the lab were uh, designed at the Fairchild, which is now Intel, okay? And um, then people, the boom started to happen and people started coming up with things. Now there is talk that, that the patents were there since 1925, but they were not able to really fabricate them. They had limitations in terms of fabrication, okay? So the ANMOS and the PMOS, as we know them, uh, started to become, um, yani come to life around the 70s, and then the CMOS became, technology became the preferred because it is lower power than the BJTs that we saw in 311. And today there is an army of alternative technologies that people are working on to be able to produce bigger and more reliable uh, chips. Great. So how are we going to walk through uh, the integrated circuits, how it started and where we are now. This is really um, the first integrated uh, uh, circuits. This image that you see here is fabricated by uh, Motorola. If you can see, you can easily understand that this is a transistor. This is a group of transistors here. And these are interconnects that go from one transistor to another. And if this is, sorry, the output goes to another transistor and so on. Sorry, this is not, I'll, I'll use the other uh, uh, 
pen. Uh, but and you got the idea basically uh, the interconnects really connect from one uh, transistor to another. And then in 1970s, this is the Intel 4004 microprocessor. You, you can see that it is modular, there are blocks, and then these blocks are highly interconnected to each other. And uh, it had a four kilobit, we're talking today about megabits and gigabits, integrated memory IC. Then in the 2000s, if we look here, this is 78, the 8088 Intel, it had 29,000 transistors. We start to talk now about the technology. Throughout the class, we're going to talk about this technology is 180 nanometer, this technology is 70 nanometer. So here, three micrometer means the L. If you remember in, in 311, and we're going to talk about this, we had the length of the transistor and we had the width of the transistor and the technology, all the technology will have one common L, which is the smallest dimension that we care about. And for example, here L is, uh, three micrometers here L became 0.18 micrometers in the 2000 and this trans, uh, uh, CPU here is really this dot that we have here so you can see now we have 42 million transistors instead of 29,000 uh, transistors and uh, this is early 2000 in 2005, Intel had 125 million transistors. The area is still small, is 112 millimeters square, okay, and um, around one centimeter square, يعني. and here it operated at 3.8 gigahertz. So the speed started to pick up. The technology is now in nanometers. It is 90 nanometers CMOS technology. You can see easily identify with your eyes the blocks that are repeating, how modular the design has to be. It's like a fabric in order to be able to get it with good reliability and, and uh, for it to be ubiquitous. Let us look here now in 2006, 291 million, three gigahertz, and now we're talking about 65 nanometer technology. Now we started to have separate cache or memory around the processing unit. There is local cache, but then there is supplementary cache okay, around the uh, uh, processor. So there are three levels of memory in the chip. Kalaheide, it is 22 nanometer. Uh, it has a 364 megabyte memory SRAM. It's more than 2.9 billion transistors, and it is now high K uh, devices where the characteristics basically increase the current. You can see the chip, it is symmetric. I'm guessing these are four processors maybe printed in the chip. And if you can see here, this is one memory cell. See how regular it is. And they have high density, they have low voltage applications and the designs are very modular, very systematic for them, for us to be able to fabricate them. And we're talking about areas of fractions of a micrometer. Okay, recently, uh, there has been a boom, not only in this special purpose processor, but there is now dedicated heterogeneous design that really services the specific software application where now we are mixing on one chip. If you look at this chip here, 35 billion transistors. Okay, and it is definitely, this is definitely one of the biggest 16 nanometer chips. And basically we have ties of application specific vector processors or vector cores with interconnect and memory. So all of this parallel computing metrics multiplication and all of these features are kicking in in today's designs. That would be great. Hello. People nowadays are, are looking at the human brain and they are thinking, well, I have 15 to 30 billion neurons. We have 35 billion transistors on the chip. Well, we have some advantages of our brain in terms of its low power operation and fault tolerance. Yani, we do not consume too much power, otherwise <laughs> our brains will, will be heated, right? So, 
so that's why we can't do it when we think but we can execute teraflops of operations with a few watts okay so people are trying to come up nowadays with what they call neuromorphic computing systems where they are um, trying to overcome uh, the von Neumann bottleneck and we will talk about this in the project because we'll be researching some new papers related to this topic and <clears throat> They are trying to make systems that resemble the biological system. يعني نحنا when we sleep, our brain builds new neurons or new connections to perform a functionality. So this means that each functionality operates or behaves differently, and 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 the neurons connect through spikes. They have an electric spike, and they touch and they connect between them. So so we're trying to perform something that is similar to this by by performing near or in memory computing. يعني بدل ما نعمل logic processor and then have the memory separate, just like our brain, the memory has to have this little functions or little neurons that can now perform this logical computation while it is storing the information and now this is where everybody is heading طبعاً, in state of the art technology نحن بالكورس مش لح ندرس عنهم كابليكيشن بس you're going to do some research on where we are and some new topics what's happening around us in the world how this is serving the new uh, heavy data intensive compute applications okay Hello. as far as we are concerned we went in history back to the 1880s we saw that in the 1960s the integrated chips started to pop up uh, gordon moore in the 1965 predicted that the number of transistors on the chip is going to double every one and a half to two years. And he made a prediction <coughs> that the technology will double its effectiveness. And the frequency had just added the transistors. By packing more transistors on the chip, I have a larger army to perform functions for me. This means that my chip can perform more computing, so it has a better compute power. Is an area that is the same and I can pack more, this means that I, the cost of fabrication, which we will talk about in the next lecture, is becoming more efficient for me and the companies will make more profit. Everything is driven by Profit. So if we follow the map which Gordon Moore predicted and look at Intel processors up to the early 2000s, we can see that the number of transistors in millions is really uh, doubling. Okay. And the same, the operation speed, the frequency is also doubling with time. So you can see here the Pentium and core processor. It reached to a point where it was a little bit slowing down in the recent years, but then they started to introduce the parallel processing, multiple cores on the chip. And as you've seen with the Vortex chip and with the Xilinx, there are many special purpose applications now that are popping up to perform this speed up, just like in neuromorphic computing. Great. But hello, with all of this, with the doubling of the frequency, and the doubling of the number of transistors, the power is increasing. And this was a trajectory, we did not reach this trajectory, but if we try to think of uh, things more, this is what has happened. We flattened the power because they started to really, instead of running one processor at 10 gigahertz, for example, is it better to run four processors maybe at uh, lower frequency? Yes, of course, and at 10 gigahertz, the processor is going to blow up from the heat. So we started to take different routes in order to cap the power. Lish, and if we look at this graph here, okay, and if we see, does anybody know what's the hot plate? Hala it is called in Lebanon, and the, we have this uh, uh, plate which uh, grandmas put castana on or uh, put the coffee on, which we plug in the electricity and we warm our hands with. So this hot plate is really here, and the Pentium 6 is very close to it. And then this is the nuclear reactor and the sun surface, so definitely 
we don't want to head into that direction because although now we have a cost effective cooling it's going to be impossible to maintain or sustain this in the near future great and is an example if you don't have enough cooling what happens to the chips they might end up blowing up okay great well, this is not only in microprocessors as we said in the phones and all you know, the devices that we use around us for communication you can see that there are multiple chips that are plugged in in addition to the concern of the power there is one more concern which is reliability and chips are now can be implement are implemented in cars in the nuclear facilities and uh, big supercomputing facilities in banks and definitely we don't want errors now that's why there's lots of design effort that is happening not only at the device but at the circuit architecture and even software level in order to guarantee that my computation is reliable this is where we have to merge all these powers and, and understand the different system complexities to combine our efforts in order to get things to work great so we have a lot of concerns, a lot of challenges, like the noise, the crosstalk, reliability, the power, how to distribute the clock efficiently in my system. Okay. And as we scale the system to deep sub micron, of course, we have the nanometer, these problems are going to grow. And then there are larger issues that the company has to do well we need to get the chip on time to market we have millions of gates out there billions now okay we need to perform high level abstraction and we need to see how we can reuse our old design so that our design cycle can be fast يعني Apple لما بدها تنزل a new phone every year with a new functionality they have to make sure that their chip serves their purpose they can reuse some components enhance others in the new technology so that their processor is stronger and stronger great so how the additional logical functionality is growing or the demand and this is how much the human effort can be so there is a big gap between the employees what they can do what's happening and how we can handle things and how many employees are available and that's why as we are scaling we need to come up with a new innovative ways to handle our designs the first thing we said is that within the same area we want to pack as much functionality as we can so the smaller the transistors the more gates i can implement the high better high computing i can deliver okay also the smaller with the scaling, people are able to make those transistors operate faster, switch faster. So we are improving the frequency of the chip. penalty cost power. So basically, but but we are gaining. And the cost of performing a function drops, and we are able to integrate two times more functions per chip but, and have high battery frequency, but we have to be careful about the design complexity. Great. The more complex the design is, the more I need in terms of an army of engineers. I need somebody to build the system level perspective design. I need somebody to realize these things from the logic level, at the logic level, يعني like if you have a, a wedding, for example, you need the planner, you need the cook, you need the executor. So I need somebody to perform the logic level. I need somebody then to take this logic level, synthesize it into an atlas that is realizable. And then I need people to build it in terms of physical design, which we'll talk about in the coming lecture. Okay, so great many levels of engineering are involved okay what's happening at the physical level 
there are some things that uh, are happening beyond this. We are trying to scale things. We are we so far we have explored only silicon to build our transistors. There are uh, there is an army of device physics engineers that are working on the other side in order to exploit this periodic table to come up with different materials that give me better, more compact, and more reliable devices everywhere from um, three-dimensional devices instead of the planar devices we'll talk about this briefly sometime later and where uh, they are involving spintronics magnetics and other properties uh, carbon nanotubes and other material biological material that can be really allow us to go down into three nanometer and beyond and that can allow us to exploit the new functionalities we we'll talk briefly about the ability to store now multiple bits in one element as opposed to one bit per uh, memory cell so all of this is happening around us in the world we conclude uh, the core the, this lecture with the first slide that we started with um things are going beyond our imagination and um and there are billions and billions of circuits around us and hopefully what we learned this semester will help us to grasp the key basics that